This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. A warehouse where everyday objects, a woman's necklace, a pair of spectacles, an iron ladle, all are touched by murder. These small white boxes, they're familiar objects. They might have contained sleeping pills or a mild sedative or just aspirin. But no, they contained arsenic. Comparatively tasteless, isn't it, Inspector? Yes, sir. The mud that I've coated on that. Obviously. Nasty way to die. And the boxes, they look so, well, innocent. Today, those white boxes can be seen in a place of special honor in the Black Museum. <laughs> the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> beneath the veneer of civilization, waiting to kill. Yes, here, here lies death. Here death seems deliberate, murder almost moderate. Here in the echoing quiet, one is a spectator amid an orgy of violence, expressed so calmly by ordinary objects. The filing spike was created for the piercing of papers, you know, to maintain orderliness on a clerk's desk, not for the purpose to which this spike was put. The piercing of the neck, the base of the skull, where the brain conjoins with the spinal column. Yeah, here we are. The white boxes, a little bit yellowed with age, the neat spidery penmanship on the tiny labels fading now, but still legible. Curry's Pharmacy, Glasgow, Scotland, they say. And the date? January 1857. They were certain they had a case. The prosecutor for the Crown. A procurator fiscal, they call it. And the quiet man in charge of homicide. Inspector Webster. The prosecutor was quite definite about it. We'll have no trouble at all. It'll be a hanging. There seems to be plenty of evidence. You sound doubtful, Inspector. Juries can be emotional, you know. When that happens, the evidence goes out of the window. <laughs> Juries haven't changed much. Almost a hundred years, have they? 
I'd rather, in the old tradition, let the guilty go free occasionally than have one innocent perish. They presented their case. In proper order, each fact, large or small, in sequence, was paraded before the 12 good Scotsmen who sat in the jury box there in Glasgow almost 100 years ago. First, there was the landlady, Emil Dangeret's landlady. She told of that summer evening in 1856. Why, Mr. Dangelier, you are dressed up this evening. I have a reason, a very lovely reason. Do you like my waistcoat, madame? Quite striking. You ought to catch the lady's eye. I trust it will. Do just that, madame. How do you do it? Dress the fashionable on your salary, Mr. Dangelier. Ah, that is something I have learned from the frugal Scots, madame. I have indeed. <laughs> you will excuse me. I must catch the steamer to Rowling and the garden by moonlight. A happy little man that summer's evening, Emile Dangelier. A happy, strutting little man in his new waistcoat, his well pressed jacket, his smart hat. On the way to the quay to board the side wheel steamer, he met his friend Robert Dougal. Mr. Dougal was a witness, too. His story was just as simple. Emil, how are you? As if I needed to ask. You are the sport this evening. Oh, thank you, Gobert. You look well yourself. Don't tell me if you don't want to, but I'll wager you have a rendezvous. I do. And you know, you introduced us with Madeline? Madeline Smith? No other, my friend. But the Smiths are Joalin. Then you've met the family? Not yet, Robert, but very soon. Tonight, just Madeleine. How long after tonight shall I have to wait for the family to accept me? How long, little man? How long indeed? That was a good part of the problem. Robert Dougal was temporarily excused from the witness box. The next witness was a letter... A letter which tried to recapture on paper the wonder of a summer night of young love. Oh, Emil. Oh, my darling. Madeleine, my love. Shh, whisper, sweet. They are not asleep yet. How can I whisper when my heart wishes to shout from the housetop? Emil, you are sweet. My darling, is this not a night for lovers? Come, darling. There is a quiet place, I know where the moon will be reflected in the water and no one will be near. Don't let the gate bang, darling. We don't want my father finding us now. A garden gate shut softly and footsteps, a man and a woman, fade away into the sounds of the night. It would be nice if we could leave the story here, but we can't. Nor could the prosecutor... There were more letters, many, many more, written by both young people. Letters which detailed the progress of the summer and of a love affair. Madeleine, your return will coincide with the opening of a social season. You will go to all the dances, all the parties, but without me at your side. I cannot stand to picture this even to myself. Madeleine, let me be your husband in truth. I cannot stand. Have faith in me. Have I not proven my love? Oh, Emil, the tears which bathe this paper, they are tears of longing, longing to be with you. There was more, much more. It all seemed endless, eternal, like the love these two pledged each other. But August moved into September and September into the fall. Presently, as the prosecutor didn't fail to point out, the social round swept over Glasgow and over the Smith family, of course. Madeline was caught in the whirl with her family. Here, Robert Dugo was recalled to the witness box. This part of his evidence, if evidence it was, held a touch of wistfulness, of pathos even. Do you think this is the proper place to stand, Robert? Not proper, but correct for our purpose. They'll have to pass this way. There's quite a crowd, is there not? Mm, the public dances of the Glasgow season are always crowded. They say more matches are made at these affairs. Do not say that, my friend. This is my great fear, that she will meet someone. But she loves you. What am I? A ten-shilling packing clock. I am nothing. Our family do not even know I exist. Where are they? 
Has something happened? I must... He stood there on the stairway leading to the ballroom, waiting so impatiently. The little man in the fancy waistcoat, beneath which was so much pride and so much love. And then at long last, he saw her alight on her father's arm from their carriage. Start up the stairway. She is... She is a princess. Is she not, Robert? She is a very pretty girl. But then, I'm not in love with her. <laughs> I will speak to her. No, you mustn't. Not here. But then... Miss Smith, no, it would be unforgivable. Don't embarrass her like this. She passed within arm's length and seemed not to notice him, standing there waiting so eagerly for the acknowledgement which never came. Shortly afterwards, the two young men went into the ballroom themselves. Emile saw his Madeleine whirling in the waltz. Heard her laughter. Why, Mr. Miller? I cannot allow you to speak to me like that. My father would consider... Oh, Pat, this is what I have nightmares over. Patience, Emil, patience. That is what she says. Patience, Emil, patience. She's going into the conservatory. Quick, Emil. Do I dare? What, didn't you see? She looked at you, pointed with her hand. Wait for me, Robert. With pleasure, my friend. Emil, here, behind the arbor. Madeleine, oh, my dear. You shouldn't have come. Yet I'm glad you're here. If I could have only but one dance with you. Impossible, darling. My father noticed you on the steps. I told him it was Robert who spoke my name. I don't think he believes me. Let him know me. I am not ashamed of what I do. I will not be a clerk forever. Not now, not tonight. I must be quick. They will be missing me. Darling, tomorrow night, come to the house. You know my window on the ground floor with the railing. We will talk about it then. Tomorrow, after the family is asleep. The ground floor window where the cat bars to keep out cats. Or was it young lovers? A strong, if decorative, grill. But there was an area entrance. According to the letters offered clearly in evidence, Amy was admitted via the area entrance to the gracious old house in Glasgow. Madeleine. Oh, Madeleine. Quickly, darling. In here, my sitting room. Here we are. We must be very quiet. My elder sister is just above, and my father sleeps very light. Madeleine, when? When? I must await the proper moment. And in the meantime, must I come to the area's entrance in the dark of night, sneaking like a thief? I did not steal your love. You gave it, darling. You gave it. What I gave, I can take back. No, you cannot. Oh, of course not, dear. And we must not quarrel either. Our summer was too lovely for us to spoil it now. I have made some tea, my dear. It must be cold outside. Shall we have tea together and pretend we are the happy married couple we want to be? Oh, of course, darling. Of course, whatever you say. Only let us see... It was a domestic scene. How the letters reveled in it. Charming, delightful. Two young people pretending marriage and stayed middle-aged. And then, in due course, and in proper chronological order, the prosecutor introduced Mr. Curry, owner and chief dispenser at Curry's Glasgow Pharmacy. Yes, the defendant. It was the defendant there in the prisoner's box who bought the arsenic from me. I was told it was for the destruction of weeds and rats. The destruction of weeds and rats. Well, be that as it may, today those little white boxes can be found in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. <laughs> Thank you. 
Continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. White is the bride's color, they say. In China, white is the color of mourning. Perhaps white was the right color for the little boxes in the Black Museum. The evidence continued. It was the stolid, honest police constable. He had a simple, sad little tale to tell. It began with a sound such as children make when they play with sticks on an iron rail. But this was not a child. This was a lover calling to his love. While the onlookers were a policeman and deaf. <coughs> For heaven's sake, who wake the family? I had to see you, darling. I had to. I told you, Emil, I could not see you tonight. What? Was he here again? Was who here again? You know whom I mean. That Minock. Since you mentioned it, yes, he was. So you could not see me? We must be discreet, darling. It's perfect camouflage. Father likes Mr. Minock. As long as Father thinks I pay attention to Mr. Minock, he will not suspect that I am in love with anyone else. Are you in love with me, Madeleine? Emil, how can you ask that? Forgive me. Forgive me, my darling. At the time, I do not know what I am doing or saying. Here it is November. The summer seems so far away. Yes, the summer. Emil, go home. I cannot let you in tonight. Madeleine, to stand here, talking through bars. Oh, you'll catch your death of cold. Glasgow in November. Damp, almost bitter. Oh, please go home, Emil, where you'll be warm and safe. I'm chilly standing here. No, not until I have held you in my arms once more. Emil, stop it. It's so late, so cold. Yes, cold and almost bitter. Good night, Emil. Madeleine! Madeleine! You can't! You mustn't! Madeleine! I'll find a way. We will go off to South America. We will get away. Madeleine, listen to me. Here, here, you. What's all this? It's, uh, it's nothing, Constable. Uh, this is near the time to be rattling windy grits. It's much too cold for serenading, you know. You do not understand. Oh, don't I? I was young myself, not so long ago. Now, on your way, young fellow. Mr. Smith is a good friend of mine. I'll know have lovesick boys disturbing his daughters this time of night. Up with you now. Get on to your house. Understand, little man? I'm telling you to move along. Yes, Constable. I understand. But did he understand? Did Emil Dargelet understand that this was the beginning of the end? That the summer was over and forever? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Perhaps he wouldn't let himself understand. However, this is all conjecture. The prosecutor was concerned with facts in their proper order. And so his next piece of evidence was a letter. In view of what appears to be the termination of our affair of the heart, will you be gentleman enough to return my letters to me at once, together with my portrait? I flatter myself you have not destroyed either my picture or the missives I sent you while we felt more tenderly towards each other. There was no answer. Madeline tried another approach. Once we meant something to each other. I trust those moments are not unhappy memories. If they are happy at all, will you honor their memory by returning my letters and the miniature I gave you? Still, no answer. Emil brooded in his room, on his job. And then suddenly there was a change. 
The prosecutor brought this to the attention of the jury by recalling Emil's landlady to the witness box. She told an interesting story. Well, Mr. Dongelier, you haven't stopped at my pier glass in a long time. I have had no reason to until tonight. Oh, a lady? Yes, a lady. With a warm heart and your smile. With a warmer heart than she has shown in some time. I see. You're a faithful person, aren't you? I have always hoped I could be. You're not looking very well. I expect to see you improve in health, Mr. Dongelier, as you improve the problems of your heart. Thank you, madame. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you will excuse me, I must not be late tonight. I must not be late tonight, he said. Yes, tonight of all nights. He must not be late. <laughs> left the house where he lived in his furnished room. There was no record, no witness, the prosecutor admitted, of what went on that night between the jaunty Emil and the beautiful Madeline. But the landlady had more to say, and what she had to add was a tale which was neither jaunty nor beautiful. <laughs> But don't tell you. Are you ill? What's wrong? Do you want a doctor? Can I help you? Mr. Don't tell you. <coughs> Mr. Don't tell you. <coughs> Mr. Don't tell you. What is it? You, you look as if you'd crawled home on your hands and knees. Yes. Yes, I did. The last block. The pay. The pay. I, I cannot stand the pay. I shall call a doctor. You're sick. You're very sick. You must have a doctor. The good woman hurried up the street, aroused the doctor who surgery was in the corner, and together they hurried back and up the stairs to the little man's shabby room. What is it, man? Where's your pain? Leave me alone. I... I want to die. Good heavens, Mr. Dozier. You will die unless you help me yourself. Madam, have you any mustard in the house? Mustard? Whatever for? An emetic. This man has been poisoned. Quickly now. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I must have some somewhere. They did their best, the doctor and the landlady. But their best was to no avail. Uh, uh... He's gone. A bad end, to my guess, is arsenic. It'll take an autopsy to find out for certain. However, now it's the turn of the police. The police, in the person of Inspector Webster, gave testimony at the trial. Inspector, tell the jury what the medical stated. Death caused by a large quantity of arsenic taken by mouth, probably in tea. And what did you find in a small wooden chest in the victim's room, Inspector? A packet of letters in perfect chronological order from the prisoner to the deceased. Thank you, Inspector. Uh, one thing more. Did you arrest the prisoner? I did. Did you warn her that anything she might say could be used in evidence against her? I did. And what did she say? Too bad. He was a nice little man. If he hadn't been so persistent, I might have liked him better. Thank you again, Inspector. There was more, a little more. Mr. Curry, the pharmacist, was called back to the witness box. How many times did the defendant come to your shop, sir? Three times. Each time she bought six pennyworths of arsenic. And what reasons did she give for these purchases? First, it was killing weeds in the back garden. Then it was rats at the Smith's country place. And finally, rats at their city house. Did anyone else connected with the defendant ever stop in your shop? A servant. One of the main servants from the Smith's house. He asked for prussic acid to whiten the defendant's hands, he said. I told him nice young lady shouldn't have poison like that around. I refused to sell it to him. She came for the arsenic herself about two weeks later. 
The defense made two points. The sweetness and the excellent background of the prisoner. The fact that no one found any evidence that the poison had been administered by the prisoner. No one saw her do it was the claim. The judge made the usual charge. The jury retired. They returned to a tense courtroom. Madeline Smith rose at the court's command and faced the jury. The foreman spoke briefly and to the point. We find the case for the Crown not proven. Our verdict is not guilty. <laughs> So ended the trial of Madeline Smith. Were the jury right? We shall never know. History is as silent as the little white boxes which lie upon a shelf in their customary place in the Black Museum. (laughs) 